Hello and welcome to Fire in the Valley. Today we have myself, Miley Pete, and we're joined by Kevin Young. Good afternoon, Kevin. Pete, hello. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, listen, it's, it's been a pleasure. We, we last spoke well, sort of in, in a group of speaking a couple of weeks ago and uh, in a TED Circles event. So we, mm -hmm. we got to meet there. So it's, it's been you know, a pleasure to have you on here. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So tell us, Kevin, who are you? What do you do? And where are you from? Uh, I'll go backwards. I am from Sainfield in uh, County Down, uh, which is a beautiful little rural village that I that I adore. Uh, it it is yeah. It's it's um, twenty minutes from Belfast. So if I want some action, uh, or if I need some action, I'm I'm handy enough in. It's like it's less than twenty quid in a taxi. Uh, but yet I'm also in the you know the. The, the back of beyond of, of rural county down, which which really pleases me as well. Uh, I work as well. My my official title most recently is a, a professional practitioner of compassionate inquiry, and I work in the field of I suppose mental well being, emotional well being, uh, emotional and spiritual mentorship is what I like to say that I do. And really, Pete, that is just helping people get their head around some things that, that they want to get their head around. Uh, looking at patterns of behavior, looking at why they do things, why they behave in certain ways, uh, looking at the relationship they have with themselves and others. That could be at home, in business, with their partner, with their kids, uh, you know, wh wherever. Uh, it, it, what people do with the work that I do with them isn't really that important to me, so I don't mind where they go or do or you know I, I'm just interested in the person uh, I am a father of two beautiful girls one who was 17 just last week one who is 14 and a half and the half's important for anyone that has kids they'll know that uh, married to Sharon we've been married now for 16 years what uh, I'm glad you asked me that because my wedding anniversary is in August and I just remembered that <laughs> <laughs> so, note to self, uh, when anniversary is coming up soon, Kev. Uh, I'm a, a dog lover. Uh, I'm a, a foodie. Uh, I love the crack and the banter. I love to be with people, but yet I am a, a seeker of solitude and peace and quiet. Uh, I'm, yeah, you know, something that I, I find difficult to say, Pete, is that I think I'm a musician. I've got an album being released very soon. The, the album will be at, in, on my front door, possibly tomorrow. Uh, it's a debut album. And I suppose that makes me a musician, which, you know, I feel a little bit weird about saying that. You know, I'm a, mus <laughs> I'm a musician. Uh, because if I only... Got, I only if, if you've got an album coming on your front door, I think that kind of makes you a magician, I, right? I, I think it does. I think yeah. it does, but I'm still, I'm still getting used to that. You know, I, I, I think it does. I think I have to say that I'm a musician. Uh, I only started playing guitar coming up to, I'm, I'm 46 this year, coming up to my 40th birthday, I had that thing of, uh, uh, you know, I've said I wanted to play guitar my whole life and I haven't done it, so either go and learn it or shut the front door, uh, and, and I decided to go and learn it, and uh, ah, sorry, I decided that I would, can, you know, I'm still learning it, I haven't learned it yet. Uh, and started writing songs and, 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 and recording songs and and yeah and now I have an album soon so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a music really at heart to Pete I'm a music lover I've yeah. grown up around music I've, I, I have a great admira uh, admiration for musicians and that art and that craft uh, and the ability to express something in, in words and, and music and, and melody and lyrics. Uh, and I was always uh, a voyeur of music, you know, or an, uh, I always consumed it and, and wanted to produce it, and now I do. Uh, so I think, I think that's me, who I am, where I'm from, and, and what I do. Would that, that cover those bases? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that's a great, that's a great, there's so many topics in there. I'm, I'm curious, when you say, well, first of all, give us the plug. What's, what's the album called? Mm. Give us a bit of background. Why, why thank you. Uh, the album is called Lonely Demon, uh, and it's in my own name, Kevin Young. And uh, I have a wee previous EP that I released 
last year, and it's called Painted Sun, as in S U N, Painted Sun, uh, and it's on Spotify and stuff under my name as well, Kevin Young. And what can people expect to hear? Uh, honesty. Uh, it, it's interesting because I was chatting to a PR girl last week, someone I'm going to use for a bit of help. Uh, and, and I asked her, what genre does she think this is? You know, and she said rock music. I was like, okay, didn't realize it was. So I'm into and love musicians like Nick Cave, Elliot Smith, uh, uh, Radiohead, R.E.M. Uh, I like Bonnie Prince Billy and Tom Waits and uh, uh, David Bowie, uh, female stuff, uh, you know, uh, Patti Smith. And I, I like music that is dark, uh, but hopeful. I like music that is honest and truthful. Uh, so yeah, they can they can expect to hear music that will help them to reflect, uh, but also that they sing along to. So uh, I like I like I like songs that pull you in. Uh, but yeah, I suppose it's rock folk folk rock alternative folk kind of stuff. Uh, so it's you know there, there there's there's not too many techno tracks on there, uh, you know and and uh, no, no country music. I love I, I love country music. Uh, not sure about Irish country music, but I I do like. I mean I would be a big fan of Wade on Jennings and Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so but yeah, not country and western. So. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so. Do you do you write your own stuff? Is that absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all literally you write it, you compose it, the whole thing. So yeah. So uh, how that process worked for me, Pete, was I I write uh, songs uh, and write on an, on acoustic guitar. Uh, I, I wouldn't be, and I, you know, I don't mean to be fishing for compliments, but I wouldn't I wouldn't consider myself to be even even a good guitarist. I'm I'm okay playing guitar. I can carry a tune, uh, and. I consider myself to be a reasonably good singer, uh, but and I would consider myself to be pretty good at at, at spinning a story into a song. So, so I write songs on acoustic guitar, uh, and then I have a great friend of mine. His name is Michael Mormika. Uh, he's in lots of bands and records lots of albums, and and we'll go and sit together and take these songs that are written on acoustic guitar and kind of then just build them up, you know, add in some drums and add in some bass and maybe a little sprinkle of keyboards and other stupid stuff. Like on the album, there's, there's me tapping a cup with a pen, you know, and there's, there's other, uh, there's a little kid's keyboard. Uh, it's called a Bon Tempe Hits. That it's like one of those keyboards that you blow into, you know, and it makes a strange, uh, so there's one of those. So yeah, the, the songs are written. Uh, as acoustic singer songwriter songs and then they, they they build up as as we feel that you know the direction goes uh and and it's, it's a lovely My, michael is a, a guy who is you know mad as a bag of more chairs uh and i am i have a keen interest in in people who are mad as a bag of more chairs so uh you know his madness and my encouragement uh, kind of seems to go well together, you know, and we have great fun and a great laugh, uh, and that's 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 how it happens. That's how that music happens. Yeah. Is I mean, what what's your reason for doing it? <sighs> hmm. That question made my stomach jump. Another question gave me a flurry of. Of excitement there you know I definitely felt an emotion of what what makes me do it uh, desire uh, uh, admiration you know I admire people who can so you know uh, yeah uh, aspiration yeah and, and admiration and and uh, it's something that I 
it's something that I really it, it, it's something that I really enjoy you know I enjoy the whole process I enjoy starting you know I, like I say I'm not a great guitar player so I'll play a chord and I'll play it wrong I'm like oh that sounds interesting I wonder what that is and I'll have to go look it up you know what when I put my finger that what is that uh, so I just love that it, it, it's it, for me it's reflective it, it, it allows me to it allows me to see and become aware of things that are floating around in my body and in my head that come out and you go oh that that's interesting I, I didn't really know I felt that way about that topic but I obviously do because I've written a song about it which then allows you to to go and do some some reflection and some 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 work on that uh, another reason that I that I do it is that I love to perform I, I like to be in front of people I like to, I like to present and I like to public speak and I, I like to perform I love that feeling of absolutely breaking it uh, before going to do something you know and, and like oh why am I doing this to myself you know and then one song in and you think you're Bob Dylan you know and, and that's an absolutely wonderful you're like this is why I do this you know that that buzz that rush that that uh, endorphins and adrenaline and, and uh, to allow me to mingle with and mix with other people who have an interest in music you know it gets me chatting to other musicians and uh, radio people and, and, and you know I just love chatting about bands and music and, and it, you know I remember when I first when I did my first couple of gigs which was only three years ago or something and just the act of going in and putting my guitar with the other musicians guitars do you know it was like my guitar you know my guitar is in with the other guy's guitar you know so it's just to have that interaction with other people uh that that are into into music you know it, it, it's uh it, it, maybe as i think of that now pete maybe that it covers up my geekiness you know because i want to go and talk to these people but if you're not a musician and you're going trying to talk to them, you're maybe just a bit of a geek, you know. Whereas if you're a musician, it gives you some sort of uh, kudos, you know, some sort of uh, a, a passport or you know a backstage pass, you know. Otherwise, you're just a blagger trying to get backstage, you know. So uh, maybe that's why as well. That it, 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 it it's definitely why it opens doors into into worlds that I enjoy being in. I would say. I just I'm, I'm curious now is it, is it a would you say it's a form of communication or is it a it's a method of telling a story or are, are you trying to invoke feelings or what what part of that all, all of those it is a method of communication it's a way of telling stories and it's about uh, evoking feelings it's about en engaging people about connecting people it's about bringing people together you know, it's about sharing. It's about sharing stories and sharing emotions and and uh, and for me as well. You know, maybe later we might talk about the work that I do. And for me, to to create a space where I might lead someone to believe that it's okay for them to share their emotional experience. Is, is a cool thing you know if I, if I can if I can yeah if I can just create that space that someone else thinks I'd like to tell my story then that's a good thing because everyone should be seen and, to, and should be heard Pete you know and, and if, if, if I'm allowing people to be seen and be heard and believe me you know if if and, and, and I, I you know I don't do this to belittle myself I absolutely don't you know but if if I can find my way of expressing myself in some art, uh, you know, or then everybody can find their way of expressing themselves, you know, and uh, if I can do it, everybody can do it, you know, and, and, and I hope that I would give people that hope or, mm. yeah, or space or, or freedom to think, do you know what, I'm going to paint pictures or I'm going to write poetry or, or I'm going to uh, cook or, or, or I'm going to do podcasting or, or I'm going to write a book or, or you know, uh, I'm going to make necklaces or write songs or play guitar or whatever, you know, because it's okay to be seen and be heard. And if I can, if I can encourage people to do that through storytelling, through creating emotions, 
uh, job done. What does that achieve when you do do that? You know, now that you have an album, what what does it unlock? Is it is it like a is it a game level or something? You almost you, you step into. I, I'm I, I'm not sure, Pete, that it's I'm not sure that it's meant to achieve anything. I, I think it's just I, I I think it's just meant to be. I think it's just meant to be. It's just meant to be in the world. Uh, it, you know, I, I, the, I have no expectation of it or for it. Uh, you know, it's interesting because you know when I tell people, you know, that I've, I've got an album and saying that recently, and people, and I know what they mean. You know, obviously I know what they mean when they say, "I hope it does well." And I say, "Yeah, great, thanks very much." And then when I think about that, I think, "Well, what has it to do? What you know? What what has it to do to do well? What you know? That's like you know, I, I don't know if you have children or you know, and, and that's like you know, people coming to see your baby in the hospital and saying, "I hope it does well for you." I think, but you know, it's here. That what 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 more does what more does it have to do? You know. So I don't know that I I I. I, I, yeah, I don't know that, you know, emotionally or spiritually it has to achieve anything. What I would love for it to allow me to do is to uh, afford me the, 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 the finances to make another one. <laughs> that, if it did that, I would be, I would be a happy man, you know. Uh, but it, yeah, it, 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 it has given me, it has given me all that is, is required of it already you know it has allowed me to play my guitar and write songs and have a laugh and i've recorded songs with my wife and she's done backing vocals and uh you know so it, it's it, i'm not sure what it, i'm not sure that I'm not sure that it needs to achieve anything mm. oh well i like it i like it i like the the freshness there you know the fact that it is what it is and you know, do do what it's done. Tell me this, fire in the belly. What what is what does that mean to you? Uh, I suppose fire in the belly for me would would mean uh, passion and. Do you mean specifically to me, as in what is my fire in the belly, or what does the statement mean? Well, more the statement because at the end I'll actually come back to you anyway and say what's okay. your fire in the belly. So it's more as, a, as an overall concept, I suppose. Yeah, uh, fire in the belly is to me is something that that does this. I don't know if you'll hear. Hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here, and you can ignore it, you know, and it'll still go. I'm still here. You need to do something about this, you know. Uh, so that's that to me is fire in the belly. That that's something that calls you and and uh, you know you that, that w when you do answer it. So when you do, okay, listen, I, I hear you. Let's talk about this. Uh, it will drive you and and uh, it will uh, encourage you. It will inspire you. It will see you through you know when 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 you think oh man i just can't be bothered <laughs> you know this, this thing's too hard uh that's when the fire in the belly kicks in and, and, it, and it gets you over that hump you know it uh and and to me it is a, a personal thing it's it's you know every man and woman and, and everything in between or either side of that uh, to them, to themselves, you know, it's it's uh, to me, it's it's usually and un unknowing to me, the fire in the belly is is when you get to when you get to know your fire in the belly, you'll you'll be getting close to knowing yourself, you know, knowing your motivation and your your drivers. Uh, 
and to me it's also something that everyone should be given the opportunity to to express to you know put into the world to put their fire in, into the world without shame without guilt without uh, you know condemnation without judgment uh, and there's there's an element that if it's if it's real fire in the belly, it will be true and honest and just. Uh, you know, it, it will be unharmful to others. Uh, it will be uplifting. It will be it will be a, a giving to the world as opposed to a taking away from the world. Uh, Just wondering with the honest and just, is that a perception thing? Or is that connected to, I don't know, a higher purpose than an overall universal balance sheet, if you like? Hmm. Well, now that you said, you know, and, and uh, so who's, who's measure of honest and just? You know, who's measuring honest and just, you know? Uh, and is it my place to measure someone else's level of honesty and justiness? Uh, justness. <laughs> uh, well, I think I think when you when you when you be quiet, Pete, and and listen to yourself, the the voice of the fire in the belly will let you know that. You're doing this for good, you know, for, for true and honest reasons, or or when you really listen to it. And maybe you need some help listening to that. Maybe you need some help to be able to tune into that. Maybe we all need some help to tune into that. It'll tell you if you're doing it to uh, get rid of something or, or you know, to, to smother something or... Uh, I think that's what I mean by true and just. If it, I think if it's a real fire in the belly... It, it will be true and just as in that it will be adding to the world, you know, and it will be of benefit to others. Uh, you know, someone might have a fire in their belly to buy up every rental might be their fire in the belly because they want to just control that market. For me, I don't know if that's true and that's just, you know, that that's that, you know, uh, on the other hand, someone might want to have 12 or 24 rental properties so that they can provide for their family and that they can uh, do some good uh, in the world and, and do some charity work. And, and that is true and just, you know. So when you ask, when you ask those questions of the fire in the belly, I think it'll, it'll tell you what, whether it's true or just. And, 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 and I think to answer your question, that is connected to a, a spiritual higher power. Uh, or at least a spiritual entity. I don't know whether it's higher. Uh, in fact, I, I don't believe that it is higher. I believe that it's exactly the same level as the rest of us. But I, I do believe that it is uh, connected to that, to, to, to truth uh, and justice and uh, peace and compassion uh, are, are things that are Of a of a spiritual level, you know, of a, of a, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm honest. You, would you say you have fire in the belly? Do you have a fire in the belly? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, and I I think Pete, I I think we all <clears throat> maybe have several fires in the belly at different points. In, in our lives uh, and they're all okay so it's okay to have one and, and to to burn it up and then to have another one you know and to burn that one up and then to have another one I think so so I, I don't know that it, I don't know that it's you know uh, I don't know that one, uh, fire in the belly is for all time you know uh, I think my fire in the belly right now would be to uh, help 
help people uh, and, and to to be able to express myself uh, and, the, and the love that I have for people without sounding evangelical. I think my fire in the belly would be to, to be able to be myself uh, and for that to add some value. So I think that would be my fire in the belly to, and to have a, I was nearly going to swear there, to have a really good laugh uh, doing it, to have lots of fun, lots of fun helping people, lots of fun, uh, you know, freeing, freeing people in an emotional way. Uh, uh, that would be my fire in the belly to, to have to have real fun to have real fun earning my living doing what I love to do you know that that would yeah that would be my fire in the belly I made a decision about well when I sold my last business Pete I made my decision that from now on if I don't like it I'm not doing it simple why because uh, there are far too many things that I like uh, to be doing things that I don't like and separate that from chores and responsibilities you know uh, you know that they're there we have to to our chores and our responsibilities you know i don't like cleaning the toilet but sometimes i have to take my turn at cleaning the toilet you know what i mean uh so but on, on, a, on a larger level if i don't like it i'm not doing it because uh because life's too short you know uh life is too precious uh to to spend it doing things we don't like uh, to be miserable to because I think when you're miserable again on a spiritual sort of level I think when you're miserable then you spread misery you know I think when you're miserable then you emit misery and not on purpose I'm not saying that you you, know, you do this on purpose but when you are miserable that's what you meet the world with <laughs> you know you meet the world with misery and if you meet the world with misery the world has no other choice but to return the compliment and meet you with misery that's just how it is you know uh, in, in, in my humble opinion so meet the world with joy uh, and curiosity and uh, then I have to emit joy and curiosity and I'm going if I'm going to emit joy and curiosity then I have to do things that I enjoy Does that sound fair enough absolutely you know it's and that's the thing it's it's what's right for you too you know mm. take us right back so where where are you from originally then and and talk to us about your family and your your growing up uh i was born in belfast uh i was born uh, and uh, i think for the first couple of months of my life i lived in lenadun uh and then until i was six i lived in twinbrook uh in in West Belfast. I remember it uh, a little. Uh, my mum and dad were were quite young. My mum had three kids by the time she was 20. And yeah, I remember living in, in Twinbrook and it being tough. You know, I, you know, I can remember the troubles, you know, and I can remember seeing strange men with guns and stuff, you know, uh, and, and soldiers and policemen and, and riots and, and uh, rubber bullets and I can remember all that uh, and then at, and we were six in, in 1981 we moved to Downpatrick uh, and you know I, I distinctly remember that you know we, we, we call it now our right to roam or a child's right to roam you know I can remember having a massive right to roam you know i can remember being like less than 10 and cycling from down patrick to torella beach which was like six miles away you know and going to torella beach and cycling home again with no helmet and you know uh three or four mates you know and and uh i was very lucky that i i uh never really knew sectarianism was never a thing in, in, in my house you know I knew of it of course you know but I, I was lucky that I had friends from all, all walks of life and all religious denominations uh, went to school in a primary school in then Patrick called St Patrick's Boys Primary then went to secondary school in Crossgar to some calm kills in Crossgar 
then went to uh, Dunpatrick Tech to do uh, my A-levels. Uh, and in the, mean, in the meantime, then I've been working in bars and, and developing a, a really healthy uh, alcohol uh, habit. Uh, <laughs> And went to Queen's University and went to Queen's to study mathematics and statistics. Uh, flunked out uh, because I was much more interested in adding up the price of three pints and a pizza and two spliffs uh, than I was of doing any, any math theory in, in, in class, you know. Uh, so, so bombed out of that and, and went and lived in Holland for about five years or something like that. Uh, living the life of a vagabond and uh, working on, on, on a, like a big vegetable auction place. Uh, never missed a day of work, you know, but was probably full on drunk for five years, you know, like from, you know, <laughs> Just from the start of it to the end of it, you know, there, there wasn't a period that, that we weren't drunk, you know, it was just it, you know, that was, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so we thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed living in Holland and, and doing everything that, it, that, that was on offer for, for young people to do, brilliant music world, you know, smoking, drinking, whatever else we're getting up to, uh, partying, raving, clubbing, uh, uh, Rasta festivals and then got to about 25 and thought okay okay if you've had a really good innings let's think about where we're at here and uh, came back home then and, and did a few jobs and then started working for Vodafone where I met my wife and uh, that's that so yeah I was back into school. How was school for you? I I enjoyed school. I uh, was probably you know if you were to rank the kids, you know I wasn't one of the really cool kids. I was probably in the next group down that were you know reasonably cool, but wasn't one of the kids that got a really hard time for you know having big thick glasses or you know uh, wearing their older brothers. Uh, blazer or something. So I, I really enjoyed school. I get on really well. I find school. I, I think Pete. I find school pretty easy. Uh, that wasn't always a good thing because I I, I was I was a, a joker and you know took the piss a lot and, and uh, didn't really apply myself. Always always done really well without really applying myself. And I think that's maybe what happened when I got to university. That you know I always breezed through school and I got to university and went, oh, oh this, this is hard, you know. Uh, I went to school in secondary school, I'm talking about particularly uh, in Crossgar, which was boys and girls, uh, which was fantastic, loved it, you know, and, and I grew up with three sisters. Uh, my mum and dad were in, in, in hospitality, so there was always a lot of girls in that environment. And then went to school and had, you know, there was girls in school and, and found that I, I uh, enjoyed and got on really well with, with girls, girls in school. I can remember the, the, sexism, the sexism of it, even when you think about it, in first and second and third year, boys went off at some part of the week and did metalwork and woodwork. And the girls went off to do home economics and cooking. Uh, and I didn't like metalwork and woodwork. Uh, and my dad was a chef, and I went to the school and said, "Listen, I don't like doing metalwork and woodwork. Can I do home economics?" Because I, at that stage, I thought I wanted to be a chef. And the school were like, "Yeah, whatever." So you know, I ended up in a class with twenty-eight girls <clears throat> and me. And at the start, you know, all my mates were like, "Oh, you know, big sissy, you, you do cooking, you and twenty-eight girls." And then they were like, oh, "Hang on, you and twenty-eight girls," you know, it's like. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, school was good. Uh, I I I I did. I mean, sports I could do. You know, again, if you're you know lining everybody up to pick the teams for football, I was maybe 
you know, in a class of 30, I was maybe, I was probably picked in the first 10, maybe the first 12 kids, you know, it was maybe number 10 or number 12, which was all right, because you weren't to stand there last, you know, uh, waiting to get picked to, to be on a team. Uh, so yeah, school, when, when I look back now, uh, we got, I got a bus to school each day from Down Patrick to Crossgar, which in itself was an experience for anyone that got a bus back then to school, you know, smoking and smoking on the bus and stuff and uh, fighting on the bus. Uh, not usually me, not, not, not ever me, in fact, but, you know, there was always a fight on the bus and, uh, uh, yeah, I would be, I would, I would have fond memories of, of school. Wish maybe, and hey, what's the point of wishing and regretting, but I wish maybe that, that I had, I had the focus uh, and the emotional stability to use the intelligence that I had better at that time, but, but I didn't. So, you know, I, I, I didn't have that ability. So that, that is how it is. In hindsight, I mean, how would you have handled you at that age? I would have uh, encouraged me. Uh, I would have Yeah, I, I think I would have created a lot more space. You know, I'm kind of imagining myself now, looking back at that, that child then, created a lot more space to, to allow that child to express themselves and, and, and telling, you know, ex explaining to, to someone who was probably trying, as I look back now, probably trying very hard to be liked you know, and, and as lots of kids do, and, and included and not rejected, uh, that it's okay, chill out, you're all, you're all right, you know, so a little bit more support, a little bit more encouragement, uh, told that it's okay, it's okay to be you, you know, just, just relax, you're all right, you know. Uh, but I look back now and I can see that I was trying very hard to be to be accepted and, and to be liked. You mentioned there that I think your dad was a chef, right? Mm -hmm. So that was sort of on the cards as a potential. What do you do when you're a teenager? Okay, well, chef. So mm -hmm. was that that was something a potential for you? Was it? Absolutely. Uh, I I again that thing of you know even at twelve years of age doing cookery in school instead of metal work and woodwork, you know, and was better than all the girls, you know, that sort of way was because uh, I'd been used to being in kitchens and we had cafes and golf club catering and all that kind of stuff. And I actually applied for when I when I finished my GCSEs, I applied for at the time it was the, the Coleraine Catering College, I think it was called back or the Port Rush Catering College. And I applied to go there. And, and I think I remember at that stage, my dad bringing me into his kitchen at the time, which was the, the Downpatrick Golf Club, and working the backside of me for the whole summer, you know, and I think then I decided that uh, I'll, I'll go and do my A-levels instead, you know, rather than, rather than becoming a chef. Uh, and it's interesting, Pete, because then, you know, fast forward into my early 30s, and I opened my own hospitality business. I had a bistro uh, cafe that I did all the cooking in, you know, and uh, loved it, loved it, loved to create with food. Uh, and it's still, you know, one of the things that I miss, I sold that business four years ago now. One of the things that I miss about that business is cooking for lots of people all the time. Uh, so I still love it. I still love to cook, you know. Uh, I still love being around food. I love, you know, I call it groping, groping produce. You know, I still love groping cabbages and, uh, you know, uh, groping loaves and, and uh, uh, 
uh, cauliflowers and that sort of thing, you know, uh, and, and yeah, for me, food and cooking and eating is such a spiritual experience as well. You know, it's a communal thing. It's I kind of think that families that cook and eat together won't go too far wrong. You know, won't go. Uh, I think when you sit and cook and eat with people, you get the chance to look, to look them in the eye, you know, and, and especially with your kids, say, what's going on for you today? Uh, so yeah, I, I fancied myself a bit of a, a bit of a Jimmy Oliver in my in my earlier days. You know, uh, what was your what was your signature dish? Uh, <clears throat> I love uh, vegetables. I'm vegetarian now. Wasn't always, only the last three years. Uh, so I love making curries, uh, and and I love making uh, hummus, and uh, I would, you know, I would bet if I was a betting man, I would bet fifty pence that I can make a better pot of soup than any any man, woman, or child that you put in front of me. So I love to make soup. Uh, I love to make bread. Uh, so, what sort of bread? Because I mean, bread's a big thing in Northern Ireland. Bread, you know, you've, bread is a, it's a religion. A whole, that's, <laughs> it's a whole. Uh, well, it's uh, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's a whole section of food all by itself, isn't it? Uh, I like to make uh, soda bread. I like to make scones. I know they're not really bread. Uh, I like to make focaccias, and uh, I've been known to make the odd sardo. Uh, you know, I I'm. Uh, keen on potato bread. Uh, I love to make wheatens and wheaten bread. I make a real mean wheaten bread. Wheaten bread. Uh, so yeah, as lo- as long as I always say with food, as long as it doesn't take three days to make. You know, I'm not into I'm not into starting something on a Tuesday that isn't going to be ready till Friday. I'm just not into it. You know, at all. You know, uh, I just want to make food. You know, started at three o'clock so it's ready for dinner time, kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, any any breads, apart from a sardo, of course, but any bread that you know it has to be proved and kneaded and stored overnight. And I'm like, nah, can't be bothered. Let's just make soda bread. And we can do it now. That's, so you you don't mind a, you know, a a reasonable prep time for a slightly shorter consumption time, but that's that's a fair trade off. But if it gets if it gets too big in the prep time it's it's getting out of hand oh oh you're back you're back so you just say that again i think you just sorry right at the end there yeah no just in terms of obviously you, you know your prep time versus your consumption time you yeah. know and if, if it's a three-day consumption or preparation and a two-hour consumption that's sort of slightly out of hand but a couple of hours prep for you know a couple of hours uh, pay, you know, consumption is a, is a fair payoff, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, you know, and I, I suppose prep time as well. I I love to go to, you know, I love to, I love to be at the market. I love to, I love to shop for food. You know, I love to, uh, and and you know, create the menu and go out and get the stuff in and, and bring it at home. So so I like to do that, but and yeah, just that idea of, you know. Yeah, like having to start something on Tuesday that you're going to eat at the weekend is just like, ah, oh, life's too short for that man. <laughs> life's too short. Uh, take us, take us right back to seven. I mean, what would we have seen as young Kev, a seven-year-old? What sort of a person would we have met? Uh, I would say, uh, and this is, you know, I, I've probably done a lot of work on myself. Uh, Pete, to be able to say this, I would say at seven, I was an absolutely delightful child. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I mean, uh, you know, and, and I say that honestly, and, and without, you know, I don't mean to be conceited about it. I was an absolutely yeah. delightful child. Uh, you were number two or four, was I right was number there? two, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, number number two or four, uh, and I was, uh, you know, and again. To say this without conceit, you know, to, 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 without sounding big-headed, I think I was a stunning-looking little child as well. I, I had the I, I had the the whitest of hair, as in you know, like white hair, you know, uh, uh, 
and swarthy skin, you know, and 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 uh, yeah, I think at that stage I was I was uh, adventurous uh, and honest, and and I think because I had just sisters, I, I was happy to be. You know, I had my own space at home, you know, where my sisters had to share a bedroom. I had my own bedroom. Uh, and and at that stage, I, I, you know, I probably, interested in the conversation we just had before uh, we started this podcast, Pete, but at that stage, I, I probably realized that, that my mother and father were probably both, um, uh, I was learning that they were kind of emotionally unavailable, lovely people, but just didn't have the, those skills then uh, or, or through their own traumas and troubles and living in Northern Ireland and where they were brought up, they had their own traumas and stuff going on to to, to not really be emotionally available uh, and was probably then uh, starting on a journey of, of looking for that emotional attachment elsewhere. Uh, but certainly at seven would have been honest and true and uh, and angelic, you know. I was, you know, you know I, I just, uh, I think I was just such a gentle little thing, you know, and and mm. uh, caring and kind and and, and compassionate. Uh, don't know what happened along the way there, but yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just a little wobble. It's okay. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've been, I'd probably been a, a fragile enough little thing as well, you know, and and. Uh, wouldn't have been over bolshy or, or, or wouldn't have been overconfident or uh, yeah I'm curious that the transition from from Twinbrook mm. through to Dampatrick you mm. know it's it's not it's not just across the street like it's a it's a decent move mm-hmm. was there a particular reason for that or was there yeah I, I think the, the troubles I think this, so that was 1981. Uh, that was like full on, you know, people getting shot and maimed. And uh, around 1979, maybe there was, there was, I remember one girl who was killed, one girl who was just, she was a, a young teenage girl, maybe 13 or 14, killed by a rubber bullet uh, at, at that stage, you know. And, and I don't care what side of any political or religious divide that you're on, killing a child with a rubber bullet is not right, <laughs> you know in any part of the world uh, for any reason, you know, uh, or, or is acceptable for any reason. So I think my parents making that move was probably a big deal for them. For me, it didn't seem like a big deal. You know, you get in, you get in the car one day and moved house and, you know, uh, that was that. Uh, but I think for them, it was their desire to escape uh, the, those those troubles. And I, I suppose at the time, so Twinbrook uh, is a very nationalist Catholic Republican area, I suppose. And Downpatrick at that stage would have been a similar demographic. So, so uh, you know, it was, uh, I think probably those reasons were the reasons that that, that move happened, you know. Uh, I suppose, you know, people from the Shankill maybe moved to Ballywalder or something, you know, as was the, t- as, you know, uh, where people from Twinbrook moved to Downpatrick. Uh, I'm curious. So your dad was was he always a chef? Yeah. And your mother did she work or was she looking after you guys? She, uh, no, she well, uh, my my mum worked uh, kind of do, doing cleaning jobs and, and worked in the hospital, you know, and and doing that sort of thing. And then when we moved to Downpatrick, my parents opened a, a fish and chip shop uh, called the Yankee Doodle. Uh, and, and we lived above it, so we lived above the chip shop. So, so my mum was a working mum, you know, she was downstairs in the chip shop and upstairs with the kids and both at the same time, no doubt. Uh, so Yankee, Yankee Doodle, why? I have, I, have no, <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. The Yankee Doodle, I have no, I have stands, no idea. It stands out all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was a very good chip shop, you know. I would still say to people here from down Patrick, like, "Oh, I remember that. That place was class." It was right opposite the old cinema <clears throat> in down Patrick. Uh, it was called the Grand Cinema. Uh, again, that you could ask why was it called the Grand because it wasn't very grand. Uh, 
so yeah, I don't know why it was called the Yankee Doodle, but uh, so my, yeah, both my parents worked, and my my dad probably uh, worked a lot more. My dad, but when I was born, my dad was an alcoholic, uh, and and you know has has been abstaining from alcohol now for over thirty years, for thirty five years or something. So congratulations to him, but. You know, when I was very young, he probably he wasn't he wasn't around a lot because he was either working or drinking, and then uh, he stopped drinking and just worked a lot, as, as I think a lot of uh, people moving from addiction do. You know, they just find a, another addiction, another way of distracting themselves from whatever it was that they were distracting themselves from. Uh, so, and I think due to that, then I, I probably had a lot of freedom as a child. You know, that that again with with. Uh, and I think maybe that was a sign of the times as well. You know, it's just, just kids. Was there, was, was there a reason that you're aware of that? You know, in terms of the drinking the alcohol. Uh, again, that that same thing. You know, it, it's uh, he was a uh, uh, grew up in in Andy Town uh, of of eleven children, in uh, you know in living in a terraced house and in, in uh, poverty and and troubles and and. Uh, probably emotional unavailable unavailability of his parents uh you know and, and how people then seek out uh pain relief to be soothed and his seemed to be alcohol uh it's, it's, that's probably as, as good a reason as, as any for for anyone to take uh, take you know uh and you know growing up then you know and, and seeing people being shot and, and seeing things happening, you know, and, and, and being part of that poverty and, and uh, is it is it any wonder that people try to soothe themselves, you know? Who who would blame them? Who, who am I to blame anyone for, for soothing that sort of pain, you know? Uh, so I think that's... As you say, it's the sign of the times. I mean, it's almost mm -hmm. the another unspoken sort of threat of the troubles, you know, was the even the fear factor and all the emotional mm. thing and, and mm. running a business through all that and mm. staff and mm. everything else it's almost mm. like yeah it was it was tough tough times mm. well surely uh you know and that was like coming out of the 60s into the 70s and things were bleak <laughs> you know, like mm. you only have to look at you only have to look at uh you know footage of, of back then it was bleak you know it was it was uh you know, Belfast was bleak, you know, and 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 poor and and divided and uh, traumatized and and uh, as you say, living in fear and, and the hypertension that, that came with that. And uh, what do people do? They seek out ways to soothe that. You know, uh, of, of those times, it was alcohol. I think now it's it's prescription drugs and and you know, class A's uh, is the is the method of soothing pain. You know. Uh, different times mm. going into Queen's maths and statistics mm. something you liked something you loved yeah something I liked and something I was good at I, 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 I found maths at school very easy uh, we would, would breeze it you know seem to have just had a a brain for it you know and like even now I, you know I would consider my wife to be a you know uh a much more academic person than me, but you know, give her a, a trigonometry problem, or, or 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 get her to do something that involves spatial awareness. You know, putting putting a cabinet together or something, and she just hasn't a clue. You know, she's like just it, her it, her brain just doesn't just doesn't see it. You know, whereas I seem to be really good at that sort of that that sort of mathematical planning and, and, and seeing. So yeah, enjoyed it at school. Did. Um, Pure maths, applied maths, and physics at A level, and uh, did pretty good at those. And and the the, the natural progression was to, to go to Queens and, and do mathematics. And, and and I wanted to be a maths teacher. Uh, but found uh, yeah, drink and drugs much more much more attractive. Uh, than, and and was really really good at drinking and drugging. You know, it was, uh, seemed to, <laughs> seemed to, <laughs> I, I seem to find that quite easy, easy as well. You know, I seem to find that quite uh, 
yeah, it came naturally to me to, to, to be able to do that. Uh, so I did it with great aplomb. Uh, and you can imagine that uh, doing that isn't really uh, conducive to doing maths and statistics. So, uh, and again, that, you know, I was going to university in 1994. Uh, rave scene, that was the explosion. So 1989 kind of thing, 1990 was just buying the explosion of, of rave culture and, uh, you know, so here was a young lad, you know, 18 maybe, getting dropped into prime, prime. You know, this, this a, a young, and I would have to say, an 18 year old, extremely immature, extremely emotionally immature, uh, young man full of bravado, and and three grand in the bank because they gave you a grant at that stage. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> can't, can't say a problem with at all, Kev, you know, <laughs> recipe for disaster, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, yeah, we, we would have been at Queens, but spent most of our time in, in the Empire and, and the Arts College. You and the rest of the year, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, I think some some went on, some did well. You know, uh, maybe people that had uh, were were a little bit more emotionally adept, uh, <clears throat> but quite a few of us, cert certainly the crowd that I run in, we all spent our time in in, in the Empire and Lavery's uh, and uh, and and Shine and uh, Arts College. Uh, your your siblings, sisters, there. I mean. Did they follow similar routes or what, what way did No, I have, well, I have one sister who is just a year and a half older than me and she owns a couple of uh, sandwich bars in Downpatrick. Uh, and she was, she was very much, and still very much is the matriarch of our family. Very typical older sister, you know. Uh, she's a wonderful human being, an absolutely wonderful human being. You know, real salt of the earth girl and, you know, like when her, her kids were younger and the sort of person that you'd come to her house and there'd be all these kids and you'd be like, who, who, who owns these kids? She's like, I don't know. But she'd be just feeding them, you know what I mean? And looking after them and, and uh, oh, they live down the street or, you know, um, real, real, real salt of the earth. And then I would, uh, uh, so she actually got married really young and, and funny, all she, all she wanted to do growing up was get married really young. And she did. She got married at, well, 20, so, you know, uh, 20, 21 kind of thing. And, and, uh, she was always very settled and uh, got involved in, in her youth club and, and you know, uh, outdoors and canoeing and mountain climbing. And, and, you know, there's a whole big, real big tight friendship group of him who are still friends today. And they're all, they're all coming up to 50, you know, that she knocked about with was from she was 11. Uh, so she's very hardworking and, and uh, runs marathons. Uh, but she's a space cadet at the same time. Do you know what I mean? She's just, uh, just, she's, she's, you know, uh, she's deadly, you know. Like we were at a barbecue at my house last weekend for my daughter's 17th birthday, socially distanced barbecue. My sister probably, I don't know, I'm not counting, like she probably had a bottle, maybe two bottles of wine. You know, we were there all evening. Uh, and then the next day there's photographs of her from, you know, and, and, uh, so that's the sort of her, you know, plays hard, works hard, uh, loves hard, you know. Uh, then I have a younger sister who's two years younger than me. Three years, maybe two. Yeah, she was two years younger than me. And she went on, she went to Queens, did it properly, did her nursing, did her midwifery. Uh, she then married a big guard down in Cork. I, no, she's out. I get myself in trouble here. Kerry, maybe. It's Kerry. Uh, by great rivalry there, so you have to make sure you get the right one. So, uh, down in Kerry, and she's still down there, uh, and and she would, she's doing quite well in, in the medical profession. Uh, and then I have a much younger sister, so a sister who's sixteen years younger than me. Uh, uh, so she's I'm forty five now. She's thirty, fifteen and a half years younger than me. Uh, so she was almost. I mean, I was almost. You know, I'd moved out of home at 18 when she was just two. Do you know what I mean? So it was almost like, you know, the, obviously, obviously still my sister, but kind of didn't grow up with her, you know, didn't, you know, wasn't around when she was growing up much, you know. Uh, 
uh, so yeah, and I think we're all, you know, we, it's a thing with families, we all have disparate lives, do your own thing, you know, but love getting together and, and catching up and enjoying each other's company. That's, that's, that's what it's all about, you know, mm. but at 25 then you come back from Holland. Mm-hmm. What's on the cards then? Uh, <clears throat> Well, at that stage, I didn't really know what was on the cards, but I just knew that uh, that I was almost coming to the end of what was already on the cards, you know, uh, coming to the end of a a real good run of full-on partying, you know, possibly the last, certainly since I went to university at 18, so the last seven or eight years of real hard partying. Uh, and, you know, knew that, right, to knock this in the head so decided to move home from holland came, came back from holland and uh just doing a few odd jobs uh found a house on, on the armor road with a couple of my mates uh continued to party but maybe not as hard you know just took the party and down a wee notch uh and then like i say i had a friend from way back who, who had quite a good position in, in vodafone and he said to me, I'll tell this story, Pete, if, if time, time permits. He said to me that, that Vodafone are looking to employ people. Do you want, you know? And he knew I had sales skill and people skills. And he asked me, did I want to go and apply for that? And I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I got an interview for like the next day or the day after that sort of thing, you know. Uh, and, and I didn't even own a shirt. You know, so I, I wasn't the sort of person that, that owned a shirt, uh, you know, uh, uh, I had her, you know, uh, you know, I'd just been bloody living rough for five years in, in Holland, you know what I mean? So you could you just, I was just, uh, really bright, really, really, uh, affable, really likable person looked like I'd been pulled through a hedge backwards. So. I had a face full of piercings, you know, lips and eyebrows and tongue and nose and, and all that sort of stuff. So I took my piercings out. Uh, I, I, I borrowed a shirt or got a shirt somewhere. It was, uh, it was a linen shirt. Do you know, like a summer open collared kind of linen shirt, which I wore buttoned up, uh, you know, uh, with a tie on. This, you know, this was like wearing a t-shirt with a tie. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was just looked ridiculous. Uh, went in an interview with the then regional manager and I think he was a little shocked when, when, when I walked into his office for this interview. And this was the good version of you? This was the good version, this was the cleaned up version, yeah. <laughs> this was, yeah, this was the cleaned up version, you know, I was wearing a shirt, no, and I was like, what do you, what do you want, I've got a shirt on. Uh, but sat down and, and he obviously, you know, knew that I was, had been around people all my life, had worked in hospitality, you know, uh, you know, was good at conversation, you know, was good at patter and, and seals and chat, you know, and, and, and saw that, uh, in me. And, and he said, uh, he said, okay, listen, he says, I, I, I like you. I like what you're about. He says, the store that we have a vacancy in is, is our Lisburn store. And he says, I want you to go, I want you to go there this afternoon to meet the store manager in Lisburn and chat to her, a lady called Roberta, chat to her uh, and see what, she, see what she thinks. He says, but before you go, he says, can you do me two favours? I was like, yeah, 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 no bother. He says, buy a shirt and get a haircut. <laughs> this is in a job interview, you know. So I left the, I left the job interview and went uh, into next or top shop whatever and bought you know a shirt a shirt and tie box set kind of job you know with the tie one of those things uh nipped to the barber got my head shaved you know just got got my hair shaved off uh got the train to lisbon changed on the train so you know got changed into my shirt on the train and <sighs> Rocked into the, the Lisburn store, you know, must have had still hair in my ears and stuff, do you know what I mean, after a haircut, you know, like, you know, and a shirt that had those square creases on the front where it had, it had just come out of the box, you know, or out of the packet. Uh, but, of course, the, 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 the store manager in, in Lisburn was a lady, 
and she was a lady that grew up in hospitality and, and hotels and you know her and I just headed off you know straight away uh, like like I think I quite often do with with females you know that, with, uh, and I mean that in a you know in a, in a platonic sense you know just in a, in a conversational mm. engagement style her and I get on great and she's like yeah doesn't she she phoned the the, the, the regional manager doesn't I really like this guy let's get him started started the next day uh, so then became so that was that was for trainee sales advisor then became a sales advisor then became a you know an assistant store manager then became a store manager then became a cluster manager uh, then became acting regional manager uh, and and loved my time there did really well there was really well thought of I really enjoyed being with Vodafone and <clears throat> really ben benefited from the, the training that they you know Vodafone you get trained within an inch of your life and in things like NLP uh, in things like uh, you know conversational management and in, 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 in sales skills and in, in, in uh you know, public performance skills, you know, that and, and, and uh, giving presentation skills and, you know, and all of this by one of the top companies in, in, in the UK, if not the world at the time, you know, so you're getting real high quality, high caliber training that I absolutely loved. Uh, and then I think because I loved it, they loved me, you know, so I, I get on really well there. Earned loads of money. Uh, partied it all and drank it all and or, no maybe not but uh, at that stage had met my wife met my wife at Vodafone uh, and we you know, started living together and, and uh, just enjoying being in a being in a settled relationship with a girl and we had out a lot and we went on holidays a lot and you know we, we certainly enjoyed those first few years of our life uh, together before we started having kids and, and settling down a bit a bit more then you know uh, so yeah that was that was that so you in the in the stores whenever you met your wife? Uh, yes, I was employed as a sales advisor, and she was employed as a store manager. She wasn't my store manager, but she was employed as a store manager. Yeah. I'm sorry, so working together. How did, did she uh, recognize the the tattoos and the the hair and everything else? Is that well at that stage? I, I don't. I wouldn't have had all of these tattoos. I would have had some. Uh, I think with her then the the connection. You know, apart from my dazzling good looks, charm, wit, and, and modesty, Pete, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a love of music. She was a musician as well, uh, and, and we were, you know, we had that connection of, of enjoying social scenes and gigs, and you know, uh, it was a real, you know, there was, re was a real connection there with that. So, an easy in, as they say, an easy in, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh wow! So you, you know, easing into the, the parenthood and. You're really getting into the whole thing, really. What what happened then? Once you once you obviously you left Vodafone. Uh, yeah, uh, I think Pete. What happened then was I, I I absolutely knew that I loved people, and I I I then I can remember at that stage in Vodafone really getting interested in in the psychology of sales and the psychology of people and leading teams and, uh, you know, motivating people and, and uh, you know, looking after people and, and, you know, I really, really, really enjoyed that. Uh, but I think that, you know, I had done, you know, I, I think I worked in Vodafone for eight years or something, uh, maybe more, nine years. And that high paced, excuse me, uh, high moving or fast moving sales environment takes its toll, you know, to do that for nine years, you know, it's target after target after target after target after target. And I was doing it nine years and loved people, loved the, you know, loved everything about it except the fact of selling phones didn't really enjoy selling phones, you know, didn't really do anything for me at all. Uh, and as well as that, then, so 
at the tail end of my Vodafone career, you know, I, I, we'd had our, our, we had two kids, two girls, uh, and I found myself, you know, when I was working on Vodafone, I would have had to go to, uh, you know, I was doing delivering training or, or attending training or, uh, in Bournemouth or Birmingham or Southampton or Glasgow or London or whatever, quite often, you know, and being away from home quite often. Uh, and, you know, doing that thing of being up in the morning and away before my kids were awake and back home in the evening and they were like on their way to bed or, or in bed, you know. Uh, and it, it, it was an interesting thing that clicked for me because I can remember having kids and thinking, I never want to do that thing that my dad did of having to work so much that he was never there. And then, you know, when you realize that, oh shit, I'm actually doing that thing that I never wanted to do. You know, you wanted to provide and you thought you were doing, you know, you wanted to, but really you weren't there. You know, and I was like, whoa, brakes on, hang on. You know, I'm doing that thing that I didn't want to do. Uh, and, and just took a, a complete right turn uh, and gave up a job that I was earning loads of money, doing really well, and said to my wife, I, I, I want to open my own uh, cafe, bistro. And my wife has always been very supportive and, and she's probably as, well, she's certainly as creative and, and as emotional as I am. And she's like, yeah, knock yourself out. So we whack a few pounds onto our mortgage uh, and, and got a few quid together, got a property in Sainfield and opened uh, an amazing little bistro called Saints, Saints Cafe. Uh, and thoroughly enjoyed thoroughly enjoy being there. And, and we turned that then into a music venue too. So it really scratched that itch. Uh, and we used to do uh, once a month, do what we call a supper club. And we'd pack 30 people in there, bring like some of the best Northern Ireland musicians, uh, Kieran Lavery and Melodian and Josh Burnside, Pat Dam Smith, uh, people like that, Sean O'Tohill, Peter McCauley, to come and play gigs for us. And, and yeah, kind of was there whilst my kids grew up. So I was able, you know, we were able to, I was working in Sainfield, living in Sainfield. My kids were at school in Sainfield. And, you know, I didn't work any nights. I didn't work any Sundays. I wasn't often away from home. I got to go to all the Christmas plays and the, you know, the parent teacher meetings. And the, when they were off on a half day, I could work my staff that, you know, just, just to, to, to work that. And, I mean, I had to work hard at my cafe, really hard, but, but it really served the need for me to be around my family and to grow up with my family. And it really allowed me to be a part of my community in Sainfield. You know, the, I mean, I had, Saints Cafe, it was like cheers, you know, I knew everybody's name, everybody knew me, I knew what coffee they drank, uh, you know, I had the place buzzing and bouncing and full of love and energy and, uh, and then again, you know, it's the tail end of that, Pete, I was, I was, you know, people had come to me and asked me, could I help them open their cafe or, you know, help them, and I was doing that purely for the love of it. And I can remember then saying to my wife, I, want, I wonder is there a job in helping people to open cafes? I wonder, I wonder is that a job? Uh, and, and I made it a job. I was like, I'm going to do that. Because I had all that, had all that Vodafone experience. You mean, I had all that sales management experience, all that strategic planning experience, all that people management experience, had all the hospitality experience, had all the neuro-linguistic programming, all the psychology stuff, you know, uh, and thought, I'm going to do that. And did, uh, you know, helped a few people open open their, their their cafes. And through that, then realized again that what I loved was the people. You know, what I loved was working with people. And realized very quickly that although people wanted some strategic help with their you know their business plan or their et cetera et cetera, you know, their suppliers, or what they really wanted was emotional support. They wanted emotional untanglement. You know, they wanted help with their, their belief systems and their decision-making processes and their, uh, you know, their ability to, to say no and say yes. And, and uh, that's what they wanted, you know. And I think that's what, that's what really excites me about this is, is, is 
helping people in, in their in their emotionality in their in their psychology uh, which then led me into the role that I'm in now it's into you know that that sort of helping people to untangle themselves and it's almost it sounds like something you almost have to do for yourself too completely still doing it absolutely uh, yeah uh, and and I'm as I'm as close to myself now as I've ever been, uh, which is a wonderful experience, you know. To be still work, still work, still working on it, you know. Still, still. Uh, I mean, uh, as a quick example, uh, so started lockdown six of March. I remember six months because I, I was holding a retreat for people in uh, the Clandy Boy Hotel to come and do sort of emotional, spiritual work with me. And uh, so we had 10 people there. And one of one of my things growing up, Pete, was that, 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 that my mum, God love her, you know, probably fairly hard for her. It was very easy to upset her when we were kids. You know, you could always be standing on the wrong piece of floor or, you know, I've spilt the wrong thing or, you know, and, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I still joke with my mum, you know, she used to say, she used to hoover the carpet, like, don't walk, don't walk in that carpet, I've just hoovered. Like, what do you want me to do? Freaking Le- le- levitate? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, know, yeah. uh, you know, and don't, don't step and touch this, and don't do it. You're like, you know, as a kid, you know. So I totally see now that, that as I grew up, I've, I've always had a fear of, of, of annoying the woman. Maybe that's why I was very good with females growing up, because I never wanted to upset them. You know, uh, a pleaser. Yeah, absolutely, completely, completely. Uh, so through my whole life, I was I was a pleaser, uh, and then come to six. So this is just this year. This idea of untangling myself and still doing it. Sixth of March this year, which was only four months ago. I had people at retreat in Clandyboy, a ten of us, and then we had dinner on the Friday and you know breakfast Saturday and dinner Saturday. And come Sunday morning, the table that we'd all sat around, there were eleven of us, you know, and I had I had specifically asked, I want us to eat together, we're on retreat together, we're doing emotional work together. I want us to eat together. Must uh, have been the last supper. Ah uh, well, just just the you know, you just you're 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 with people and when, when you're with people like that, you're with people. previous 15 years when you're doing this deep emotional work so Sunday morning came and, and we came down for breakfast and, and uh, the table that we had been sat around had been separated out and you know just moved apart again and there was only space for I don't know maybe six or seven of us uh, and I was like oh shit you know uh, I'm kind of not liking this I wanted us to eat together you know I wanted us to be together for, for our food and uh, and I said to a young waitress, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what age she was, 26 or 32 or something, you know, whatever. I said, uh, sorry, listen, we're, we're all together here and, and you know, we're, we're a group and, and we were eating together and, and now the tables are separated. And she said, yeah, 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 we've just put your other guys just over here, you know, at a table kind of over behind, you know, she's just, we're going to set four of your guys over there or whatever. And immediately in me, there was a sense of this is wrong. This, this isn't what I want to happen. But I also felt that young child in me go, okay, you know, don't want to upset the woman. You know, don't want, don't want, to, don't want to annoy the woman. And in that moment, because of the work that I've done, I was able to say, you know, and this is all in, in milliseconds, you know, I'm like, hang on, what's going on here? So that young boy in me, is now afraid of upsetting this woman uh, by asking her to sort this table out and having to say to that young person in me, hey, listen, it, it's okay. This isn't, this isn't your job to speak to this woman. You're only six or five or four. You can chill out. This is my job. I'm a 45-year-old, six-foot-one, tattooed bloke. It's, it's my job to speak to the woman. You, you don't have to worry about this. And just said to the girl, 
you know, said really politely, uh, no, listen, I'd, I'd much prefer if we were eating together. There's a group of us, there's 10 of us, and, and, and I, want us, I want us to be together. We'll, we'll move up and we'll squeeze a few people in. And she was like, oh, all right, okay, no, no problem, I'll, I'll, I'll sort that. And did that, the palpable relaxation in my body of, oh, just that child going, oh, I don't have to fix that. I don't have to sort that. You know, I don't have to be worried about that. And I was able to then, nobody else, knew, nobody else knew what my experience was right then. You know, no one else. This is all in, this is all in me, you know. Uh, was able to then, so after we'd had breakfast and come back and we were doing another session uh, of work and was able to explain to the guys that I had been teaching all weekend about emotionality and, and triggers and uh, behavioral patterns and was able to say, guys, this is it in real time. You know, this, this work is ongoing and real. And I ain't no bloody guru. You know, I'm, you know, I'm doing this work as well. And if you want to free yourself, if you want to feel that uh, enlightenment, for want of a better word, you know, if you want to experience that enlightenment, you need to do the work. And you need to do it in real time. You know, if you, if you, if you want that freedom from those behavioral patterns, do the work. Because in that experience with that waitress, if I hadn't fixed that, that would have ate me up all day. And I went home and said to my wife, bloody waitress, and I should have done this. And see when the next time I go there, I'm going to and punch her in the nose, you know. Uh, and that would have rattled me for days. Whereas when I was able to deal with it in real time, that's it done. You know, so I have untangled that, you know, I, you know, I, I do know that I have traits and behaviors like everyone else uh, that, that have been uh, well, that just haven't been healthy. You know, and, and I'm not going to make myself wrong for those. I'm not going to. I'm not going to condemn myself for them because they are what they are. They've been, you know, Gabor Mate says that, that everything that happens, everything that's wrong with you, began as a, as a survival technique in childhood. Uh, you know, and, and and I know that everything that is wrong, inverted commas, with me, started as a survival technique in, in early childhood. Uh, so I'm not going to make myself wrong for those. I'm still working. And the beauty is now, Pete, you know, when I was having chatting to someone yesterday about this, the, the beauty is now that I love to be triggered because when I get triggered, triggered, I reveal something about myself. When I get triggered, I start to see these things that I didn't know were in there and I can do some work. And if I get triggered, I say, that's mad. I've just been triggered by that thing. That's class. So rather than reacting and getting angry or, or, you know, drinking or taking drugs or whatever, I'll be like, that's really interesting. I wonder why that triggered me. You know, so it's, it's so this work, I, I, I you know, it, it's ongoing. And, and to do this work for me is to be alive, you know, to be in the world and to be amongst people. And, you know, there will be a time when this work stops for everyone and that's when you're dead. I mean, it, it makes so much sense. There's, there's two things I was going to come back on. One was, you know, when you talked about learning the guitar, mm. you know, you, you change the tense from you learned the guitar to learning. Mm. You know, you're saying I, you didn't finish it, but I, I'm assuming you're saying it's it's almost something you, you never, you've never learned the guitar. It's, it's, a, it's a process. Completely. It's a journey. Completely. Completely. Uh, as is, as is being me. Hmm. I think the other thing there really was, you know, and you use the sort of phrase of listening to the voice of the fire in the belly. Mm. And I was curious that one, that was third person, but also it's something there. And, and even your tone of voice at the time is quite low. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a, a, well, I don't know. You tell me what, talk to me about your inner voice. voices maybe uh, and, and we all have you know parts of us there's a, there's a lovely you know, 
theory in, in psychology, or, which is internal family systems uh, and, and different parts of us that speak to us in, in, in different ways. Uh, and I think we all have to learn our, our, our voices uh, and yeah, I think, as I was saying to you, I think that the, 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 the voice that I hear sounds, you know, <laughs> I hear voices. We all hear voices, you know, just some people don't know that they do, you know, some people don't know that they're reacting to them. It's funny, Zara, yeah, because someone said that the other day. I was like, yeah, I used to say, yeah, yeah, I hear voices all the time. And I was like, um, you change the language to, do you have an inner critic? And like, oh, yeah, yeah I have loads of those. So, cool. Mm. Same thing, is it not? Same thing, completely. Uh, an inner critic and an inner coach and an inner uh, fearful uh, part, you know, and, and an inner... Uh, uh, saint and demon. Saint and demon, mischievous part, uh, adventurous part. Uh, but I think now, Pete, what I'm able to do, and that's through meditation, through mindfulness, through work, through my compassionate inquiry work, is, is, is value those voices create space for those voices, allow them to be heard, enter into relationship with them. But the relationship is between me, my essence, and this voice, which is just, which is just a part of me. It isn't me, you know, it's, it's, it's just something I've learned or picked up or I'm repeating or mimicking and I think now I'm quite good at listening to the, to the me voice which is quite often a reflective complative complicative complative uh, stillness and silence which is good, which, which, you know, creates that's that stillness that, that I think I've only really been able to find, you know, certainly from coming into my late thirties, forties, doing this sort of work that I do now. Uh, yeah. And, and those, those inner voices for me now are usually, you know they'll they'll have a pop, as a, and and but I but I'm quite good now at recognizing them pretty quick. You know in in in, in real time. You know, uh, and saying hang hang whoa I, you know hang on sorry, I beg your pardon. You know, uh, can we can we just chat about that? Why are you calling me a dickhead? You know, uh, and and to be able to have that that sort of conversation and and playful and I like to be playful with that and. Uh, curious about that and open to it uh you know rather than trying to bury it you know uh bury it in, in drink or drugs or, or or netflix or or you know uh whatever shopping food biscuits people pleasing aggression uh you know so i i i'm, I'm happy to create that space and know that they're there and uh but but the one that I, the one that I am, seems to be quite clear at the minute, you know, and that idea of being able to be, you know, being able to be the, the, the watcher or the listener or the awareness of the voice rather than the voice itself. So to be the awareness, to be the, to be what hears the voice rather than the voice itself. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate this, this slips into conversation and concepts that, that, that can sometimes seem uh, unusual, but I but I, I I hold firm to the idea that that we are the experience. You know, we 
we are the experience er sorry i beg your pardon we are the experience er and, and experiences change objects change our body changes our mind changes our brain changes the world changes but there's something at the heart of all that there's a stillness there is the experience that is not never changing it is non-moving it is still it is compassion and love uh it is openness and and it is uh fearless uh and, and that's that's the voice that's not even a voice it's just an experience it's experience in being the experiencer it's awareness being aware of itself <laughs> you know it's 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 awareness being aware of itself uh which uh which feels right to me you know it it, it kind of fits to me it, it just seems I, I i seem to be okay with that and and i'm i'm okay with being okay with that you know uh i have a great i have a great love at the minute like i was saying earlier of of, of solitude you know, I have a great love of of allowing myself to be still, you know, and, and just be that, just be awareness, being aware of itself, you know, and, and uh, I, I, I think that's something that we should all try experiencing, you know. Uh, is being the experiencer instead of, you know, instead of being the experience, being the experiencer of the experience. I liked it in the um, similar context, and I think for anyone else possibly listening, uh, on, on the NLP side, mm. I think the, the way it was explained to me anyway was that you had somebody who was in a film. Mm-hmm. You were in a cinema then, so you could either be the person in in the film, mm -hmm. you could be the person sitting in the cinema watching the film, so you're experiencing, you know, what somebody else is going through, mm -hmm. or you can be the person in the projection room, watching the person watching the film, mm -hmm. you know, so depending on the position, as you say, that sort of awareness to almost whether it's bird's eye view or whether it's experiencing the sp experience, is <laughs> it going through it? And, and here's where it gets really good, Pete, because it's all the same. It's all born out of consciousness and it's all born, you know, our, our experiences can only be born out of consciousness, you know, and, and, and uh, what we really come to see then is that it, 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 it's all the same. <laughs> there is no inside, there is no outside. Uh, there is no experiencer, there is no experiencee, uh, there's just the consciousness that all this exists in, you know. And, and I read a lovely, a lovely way of, a lovely analogy of describing this, you know, and thinking if, if, if you and I, if you and I went somewhere in Straban there, you know, and, and found a nice field and we stood in that field uh, and stood in a, in a nice space, uh, great, and then we decided to build a house on that space, uh, and we built a house on that space. The space is still there. The space is still the same space as it was before we built a house on it. And then if we decided to pack that room full of people coming and going on a party, and people came and went for decades, families grew up there, and you know uh, things happened, and you know whatever stuff went on and uh and then at some point someone came along and decided to knock that house down because that had been there for 200 years the space that's there is still the same space that was there 200 years ago and everything that has happened in it and around it is 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 life or our experience is but the space is still the space and, and we at our, for me and in, in, in my beliefs anyway, we at our center, at our, we are the, we are the space, you know, 
and it's it's never changing it's always still it's always it's always there we can build houses and knock them down and build other houses and build a factory and have parties and but we're we're just still the space and it all just happens in the space and is, is made from the space and is made from consciousness and i know that gets very deep and i don't even know what i'm talking about half the time this is experiential <laughs> do, you know, do you know what i mean uh but is that is that space? I mean, is that your your principles? Is that your ethics? Is that that's your your core building blocks right there? Well, you see, building blocks and ethics, they're just experiences as well. <laughs> we have created them out of consciousness too. True. You know, they're, they're, they're just, they're, so they'll come and go. You know, mm. they'll, they'll come and go as well. Uh, but, but I know what you mean, and, and the, the answer is yes, but also being aware that that space doesn't need, it doesn't need ethics and it doesn't need building blocks. It just is. <laughs> do, you know, yeah. do, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, it, it just is. Uh, it just is what it is, and it doesn't care whether you build a house or build a factory or have a party or... And it has no, it has no hmm. desire to to have an opinion about that. It has no desire to affect that. It has no desire to affect those experiences. It's just there, surrounding those experiences. Just around that, then I mean, to it'd be interested to look off, you know, look the layers within you. So you've your mind, your body, your soul or spirit, whichever, mm -hmm. I don't know, are they the same thing? Does that cover the layers? Or is there, is there more there? So I know that that's deep and I've just hit you with that, but. <laughs> Good question. Uh, you see, even those are my, my, certainly mind and body, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, uh, there's a lovely Buddhist meditation. Uh, it's, it's called meditation on emptiness, uh, and and it, it, it's that sort of thing. It's considering that you know I am not my I am not my body because I can't be my body if it's my body. You know I can't be the possessor and the possessed at the same time. So if it's my body, what does the body belong to? Who who is my if it's my body? And 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 you know so I am not my body, and the same with my mind. I'm not my mind because if it's my mind, my mind belongs to me. So who's the me that my mind belongs to? So I'm not my mind. I'm not my mind either. Uh, and I can't be. I can't be. A, I can't be an accumulation of both. Because if I'm not my mind and I'm not my body, if I add my mind and my body together, it can't add up to me. You know, you can't add a flock of sheep and a flock of cows and get a flock, a herd, a <laughs> sheep and a herd of cows, and get a flock of birds. You know. Uh, so I'm not my mind. I'm not my body. I'm not a. I'm not an addition of both. Uh, and if I take them all away, there's just emptiness. They, they, you know, they, 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 there's nothing there. So what am I? So if I search for myself, I can't find myself. I don't exist. And that's a, that's a Buddhist meditation and emptiness. You, 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 there is no you when you go looking for yourself. It's it's an imaginary concept. It's, you've constructed it. Uh, so so so, what does what what are you then? You know, what does that what does that leave and what that leaves for me is that idea of, of of consciousness or essence or soul you know that there is only that that's that's what we are <laughs> you know that's that's what we are that's that's what everything is you know and and that to me you know that is life and it's not that i have a life it's that i am life you are you are life you know, that plant behind me, that is life. Uh, and, and at the base of it all, that's all the one life. And that, you know, that's the concept of non-duality that, 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 that it may take many, many forms, but it's, it's, that's what we, we are. So what, what we are, what, what goes beyond body, mind and soul is, is life, you know, uh, 
and how can how can you then be how can you then be racist or sectarian or homophobic or uh, you know how can you then hate if you are what you are hating you know you're hating yourself by hating anything you're hating yourself because if we're, if we're all that one life you know you're, 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 you're hating yourself you know with, with, with it, just slapping a label on it and, and, and hating it but but really it's really it's you you know that, that, that you're hating uh, you know I, I, I kind of love the idea that you know I love simple things like the idea that you know the water the water that was on this planet when the dinosaurs were here is the same water that's on it now there has never been any more water. You know, there's, it's the same stuff. You know, what I mean? you know, the, the, like, that's where that's still the same water from millions of years ago. There isn't, there isn't any more. There isn't, there hasn't, none of it has been taken away. You know, uh, and and that's kind of the same with with life. You know, it, it's the same life. You know, it, it, we might call it different things, but. It just, it's just, it's omnipresent. It's, it's, it's always there. It's always going to be there, uh, even when we're not. Even when the Earth's not, life will still be here. And so, you know, in, 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 in energy or in, and you know, and again, I, I don't know enough to understand this, but I just know that it seems to sit right with me. Mm. You know that, that uh, and I'm okay with that. I don't. I don't need to know because if I need to know, then that need to know is a searching, and that searching is that's created out of out of the the act of 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 or the activity of egotism. I don't need to know that. I just need to be aware. I don't need to understand it. I just need to be. I just need to be aware of it. You know. I just need to experience it uh, and I'm happy enough to sit in that experience you know that, that I'll, I'll come and go but some part of me will still be here because when the body goes the body will go when the mind goes the mind goes but there's still there's still the thing that's beyond that there's still that idea of life where does that go where does that life go hmm. maybe it comes up as a tree or maybe it, I don't know I don't, I don't know where it goes if, if, if I go there and be able to come back I'll come back and tell you <laughs> But, uh, you know, and, I, and, and so I kind of think that we've always been here, that we are always here and we'll always be here. Don't know in what form or how that works, but by taking my argument and picking it apart, then, we, then we've always been here. You know, that, that, you know, that, that space before it was me was something else that consciousness that life before it was me was something else and after it's been after it's been this it, it'll be something else hmm. and i don't know how that works people but but i'm all right without knowing you know i'm all right with i'm all right with sitting in that sitting in that not knowing are you where you're supposed to be do you think i don't know that i can be anywhere else <laughs> yeah yeah I, I would imagine so uh uh you know i think that that life has has freedom and and uh you know how how, how could how could i how can i be anywhere else you know and how it, yeah yeah so so yeah i i i must be where i'm supposed to be because because i am you know because i'm here uh and how else would i have gotten here if i wasn't supposed to be here you know, uh, whether that's a conscious decision is, 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 I suppose, is another conversation, but. I think uh, that's, well, for me anyway, it, it, it involves an element of acceptance. Hmm. You know, rather than saying, oh, well, if, if that hadn't happened, if this hadn't happened, and then I wouldn't be stuck here and blah, 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 and shoulda, coulda, woulda, you know. Let me tell you a couple of, can I, have we time? Can I tell you a couple sure. of funny things? Yeah. yeah. I remember, uh, I remember having a conversation like this, but not as deep as this with my then 
probably seven year old daughter. So this was 10 years ago, you know. And what I was trying to say there, you know, trying to say there, listen, you know, if, if you, if you go, talking about getting into school tomorrow, if you go into school tomorrow and believe that you're going to have a good day and the good things are going to happen, they probably will. That's kind of the conversation I was having with, having with her, you know. And if you go into school and you're mean to people, then people will probably be mean back to you and mean things will happen. You know, it was, ch- it was a childlike conversation like that I was, was, I was having with her, you know. Uh, that if you go out into the world and you, know, you be nice, then that, that's what you'll get. And in her childlike fashion, she says, so, Dad, if I think that I'm going to find some money, will I find some money? I'm like, oh, shit. Uh, you know, and the, for me, you know, there, there's, the, there's the, the universe, if you want, or the, the, you know, you're being tested. You know, you're, you're, there's your theory being tested. And how can I then say to a child, no, 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 I didn't mean that. You know, uh, so I just said, yeah, darling, you know, if, if that's, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you go out and, and that's what you're expecting, if that's what you're putting out into the world, then that's what'll happen. I says, I don't know when it'll happen or, or how it'll And she was like, okay, great. You know, carried on about her business. Yeah, as, as kids do. Uh, and that was a Thursday night. And uh, on the Saturday, I was working in Saints. Uh, I came home from work and, and my daughter said, Dad, guess what happened to me today? I was like, I don't know, love. What happened to you today? And she said, I found two five pound notes in Marks and Spencer's. I was like, right you know uh and she said yeah you, you said that would happen i was like yeah i did you know and she says yeah i, I found it with nanny and we, and we went i wanted to hand it in to customer services she said so, you know I, I wanted to hand it in and we stood at customer services for 10 minutes and nobody came and granny just said to me rosa put that money in your pocket and just keep it it's probably yours and she did and she came home with two ten, with two five pound notes and i'm like like WTF, you know what I mean? Like, holy smoke, you know? Uh, so, you know, and I'm like, okay, listen, I don't know how that works. I don't know, I don't know, but, but I, I'm, I'm happy to go with that, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm into that, you know? Uh, okay, great. And then, uh, so when I left my cafe four years ago, uh, no, this was about three years ago, and I was starting to do my work with Gabor Mate and, and venturing into this kind of mm, emotional, spiritual kind of stuff. And, and I can remember I was watching a, a webinar uh, by, by uh, it was a guy, uh, oh, a big black dude who's in, who was in The Secret. I'm not a fan of The Secret, but uh, oh, his name will come to me. But he was talking about stages of enlightenment, you know, uh, uh, Michael Bernard Beckwith was his name. Michael Bernard Beckwith. He was talking about stages of enlightenment, you know, and he said, stage one, you know, you'll believe that everything happens to you and then you're a victim. And I was like, nah, I don't think of that. At stage two, you know, and something else. And he was going through these stages and he got to four. I don't know, I don't know how many he was going to go to, maybe 10 or something, but he got to four. And he's like, well, when, when you're at stage four in, in your spiritual journey, uh, you know, you, you'll appreciate that you're a co-creator and that you can have an, an effect on, on the world that you live in and that as you, as you, you know, bring these things into your imagination, you'll be able to create these. And I'm, I kind of thought, ah, I think I'm about a four. You know, that'll do me, I'll, I'll stick with four. You know, and he was saying, when you're at four, you'll see signs, you know, you'll start to get signs of, you know, if you're, what way to choose, or what path to take, et cetera, et cetera, you know. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, yeah, I, I think I'm four. You know, I think I'm a four, I've, you know, I've, I've seen signs and I think I've been guided before, you know, in some sense or other, you know. Uh, and at that, I, I, I paused the webinar and I was like, right, I'm going to go make a cup of coffee in the kitchen. And I, nobody else in my house. And I walked up to the kitchen and I was being very playful. I said, right, okay, you know, if this is it, give me a sign. You know, if, 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 if I'm doing the right work, you know, if I'm, go, if I'm going to do this Gabor Mate stuff and if it's, if it's the right work, give me a sign. You know, and I was expecting a, a book to jump off the shelf and open up a certain page or, you know, the dog to flip and piss a word on the floor or something, you know, or the clouds depart and, you know, and none of that shit happened, you know, and I was laughing at myself, I was going, I can't, you are a muppet, what are you, you know, what are you even, what are you even doing, you know, stop being ridiculous, uh, but still thinking, you know, like turning around and waiting to, to, to notice like a, a word in a picture of, a, you know, you know, and, 
like, oh, you're a crazy fool, Kev, you know. Uh, but enjoying, enjoying being playful with this idea, you know, enjoying being playful with it. And at that, I thought, right, okay, I'll go back and watch the rest of this webinar. And uh, just walking back down in the house I live in now, back into my wee back room. And just as I got to the room, my phone rang. Uh, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, it was a number that I didn't recognize. And I answered, I said, hello, Kevin speaking. And it was a girl's voice that I didn't know. And she said, ah, oh, Kevin, hi. Uh, uh, my name is, and she told me her name, and she said, uh, I, uh, I've just been following some of your stuff online, and, and, and I think I need to do some spiritual and, uh, and emotional work, and I think you'd be the right person to do it with. And I, I don't know if she heard me or not, but I went, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I'd just been asking for a sign to show me that the work that I was doing was right, you know, and I was like, uh, Okay, okay. Uh, oh, tell me your name again. Uh, sorry, what? So, yeah, uh, you know, I was completely shocked. And I got chatting to her. And as I was chatting, then I thought, this is my mates wind me up. This is, you know, this is Beatles about kind of stuff here. I'm getting, I'm somebody, I'm like, somebody's taking a mic out of me here, you know. Uh, but they weren't. And, and we agreed to meet the next week. And I kind of hung up and hung the phone up. And I was like, shit. That's a bit mad, you know, uh, just like, okay, you know, coincidence, sign, uh, serendipity, being where you're supposed to be, uh, I don't know, you know, I, 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 I don't know, but, but, uh, but I'm happy to go with it, I'm happy to trust it, I'm happy to relaxed into that, you know, uh, you know, the big buzzword now is all about manifestation, isn't it? Manifesting what you want in your life and all that, you know, affirmations, uh, manifestations, all that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure that I, I'm into that in that sense, you know, but, but I'm certainly into being open to life. And, and, and the experiences that it might put in front of you. And, and quite often, Pete, we ask for signs or people ask for signs, but they don't shut their bloody mouth long enough to hear if it's being answered or not. Do you know what I mean? Uh, they don't, they don't, you know, they, they ask for a sign, but yet they don't create the space in their life to receive anything. You know, and they, they're still going at 200 mile an hour, you know, uh, but yet, you know, asking for asking for something and, and just not creating a moment of stillness for it to be, you know. Uh, and the final part of that story, I'll tell you very quickly, is and this was just last week. I was doing uh, uh, meditation, morning meditation, and I done my meditation. Oh, great! And, and coming to the end, and I was being very good, and you know, I liked to at the end just. Uh, just be, be grateful for the, be grateful, just spend a couple of minutes just being grateful for the ability to meditate and, you know, and, you know, just, just give thanks for, for being alive and, you know, and all that kind of stuff and, you know, doing, doing it all very well and, you know, doing my gratitudes and doing all the right stuff, you know, ticking all the boxes and, and, uh, and just at the end, and I just said, uh, and I'd just like to ask for, uh, it's just me and my, you know, Speaking to myself, just like to ask for some guidance, just that, that whatever I'm doing is right. And this voice as loud as get out, Pete just went, and I am going to swear now. The voice was like, would you fucking shut up? Who are you asking? You are the guidance. You know, this, this real powerful, you know, idea that you are the experiencer. You know, you, that, that, that there is nobody to ask for guidance for. You know, what, who is it that you're speaking to? You know? Just do your thing, you know, <laughs> go and do it. Uh, and it kind of shook me in my meditation. I was like, oh, right, okay, uh, okay. You know, I kind of heard, heard, heard me telling me off for, for asking me for, for guidance sort of thing, you know. Uh, and I thought, oh, all right, okay, yeah, I'll go with that too. Uh, so. It's a bit like, um, what was his name, Graham, on Blind Date? 
Do you remember Sulla Black and R. Graham's yeah. going to give you... <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah. booming voice comes in. This is going to be contestant number one, you know? <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. I was like, oh, shit, but I was like, oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, just to... So I, I am into that idea of concept of non-duality and, and we are all the same level of life and consciousness and you know uh and when you silence yourself enough you'll know what your fire the fire in your belly is you know you'll, you'll know what that is because uh, you'll hear yourself tell yourself uh do you think you're evolving ah oh, without a, sh a shadow of a doubt uh no let me correct myself pete i think i am uncovering I think I am stripping away lots of uh, conditioning and beliefs and trauma and uh, fears and insecurities and, and uh, other people's beliefs and other things that have been handed to me and other people's guilt and other people's shame. Uh, and, and shame that I've accumulated over the years and I'm starting to shed all that and what you get at the middle when you shed it all that is what you were looking for in the first place uh, so evolving I suppose that is an, an, an evolving but well, if you're shedding I mean do you think there's been a point in your life when you've come to that fork in the road where there's you the actual you and then there's who you are today you know, and those have gone on separate journeys. Now it's almost like you're trying to get back to it. No, no, I I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I I would use a different analogy in that you're you're always at the center of you. There's just that much bullshit piled on top of you that you don't know that you're there. So you've never left yourself. Mm -hmm. There's no, you've you've never moved away from yourself. You have. Well, change the context then. I mean, when when was the? Do you know a point in your life when there was no bullshit? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I'm completely there yet. Like I don't know. No, no, I don't know no bullshit, but I think at the minute there's a, there's a, a there's a, I understand a lot of that stuff that was that was hanging on me. I understand a lot of uh, family of origin condition. I understand a lot of, of uh, generational trauma. I understand a lot of cultural trauma. I understand a lot of Catholic Christian trauma. I understand a lot of uh, uh, Irish you know, national trauma uh, that we all feel and suffer from, you know. Uh, you know, I understand sectarian trauma and weight and baggage. Uh, I understand that I have uh, racist condition conditions in me, you know, and, and I understand that. I understand that, uh, that my, my white privilege and, and I understand that, that these things, you know, none of them are my fault, you know, but uh, a lot of them have been hung on me and, and you, 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 you behave and, re and react to them. And I think I'm now starting to be able to pick a lot of those off and set those down. Uh, and that's through work with, you know, I, I, I do a lot of work with a guy, I think you know, Stephen Brown. Uh, Stephen and I are both compassion and quiet practitioners and we, we help each other a lot. Uh, meditation. Uh, Listening to my wife is always a good, uh, it's always a good, <laughs> a good, a good reference point. Uh, I'm yes. curious is whether we come into this world with that, you know, or whether they, they talk about, a, a, you know, starting with a clean slate or, a, you know, childlike innocence that you start with an empty basket as such, mm. as in this, this physical life, if, if you want to go there. Mm -hmm. But then everything is, you know, the, all the BS is then piled into the, into the shopping cart. You know, you gotta, you gotta go and chuck it all back out again at some point. Correct. I, I think so. You know, and nobody puts it in on purpose. It's not your parents' fault. It's not anyone's mm -hmm. fault. They don't. It's not, you don't have to blame. It just, it just is what it is. You know, and we're, we're, a, we're a, you know, we're, we're a, a society that that uh, doesn't allow for trauma to be expressed. We're, we're a society that doesn't allow people to. Uh, validate their own experience you know that uh, 
you know, and very vulgar examples. You know, someone saying, "Oh, you know, my uncle died in the troubles." Oh, well, my dad died in the troubles. We we have this this idea of measuring, you know, people's experience against another instead of saying, you know, your experience is valid, you know, uh, and allowing people to validate their own experience. Uh, so I think you do. I think you. I think you land here as a clean slate, but even in the womb, you know, if, if, if a woman is experiencing trauma uh, through for whatever reason, you know, poverty, addiction, uh, abuse, uh, cultural, religious pressure for being pregnant, then her body will will be reacting to that stress by creating cortisol and creating an, uh, adrenaline that will be affecting the, the baby in the womb. So it's already it's it's already being affected. And you know that that in itself, that's a whole nother conversation, Pete, because that idea of patriarchy and we don't again, in my humble opinion, we don't expect we don't respect the idea of motherhood as the single most important thing in in, in, the, in the universe, you know, like we 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 and bringing that right back, we don't support families, we don't support women to have children, we don't support their their emotional needs. You know, uh, uh, we don't support men to support women. We don't, you know, we don't. We have this total patriarchal society that uh, that we completely denigrate. Is that the right word? Uh, you know that we we we. Uh, Degradation of of of, of the feminine. Uh, so so people are arriving in this world already having experienced stress because in our in our in our culture we don't support women we don't you know uh, and that that is the that is the that's the causal trauma you know that's that's why people go on to be addicted and alcoholics and and fight wars and you know. Uh, because we haven't, we haven't, we have a patriarchal society that doesn't support women, femininity. Uh, and if we did that, we have all the science in the world to show that, that if we did that, if we can support women and families uh, with early childhood uh, emotional attunement, that we reduce the amount of addicts, we reduce the amount of people with cancers, we reduce the amount of people with... with uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome and asthma. We reduce the amount of people with with mental illness. We relieve stress on our our, our medical services. Uh, people are more productive. People are more joyful, more fulfilled. Uh, we know this, but to do something about it is saying that we have completely fucked up, and that's a big ask for our political leaders right now to do. You know that that. Right now, especially now, you know, we should absolutely be be busting our backsides to support families, and children, and, and and communities, and and including people, and and you know, engaging people, and and connecting with people, and helping people. Uh, you know, this isn't about economic productivity. You know, this is about emotional and spiritual wellness. <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm sure some economists would come on and say, "Well, we can't have emotional and spiritual wellness without a healthy economy." And to me, that I, I you know, again, another conversation of oh, that's you know, absolute bullshit. You know, uh, we have money to do plenty. Uh, you know, if 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 you know if 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 we wanted to fire a load of rockets into a country somewhere, we would have plenty of money for that. You know, uh, we, there, there's there's plenty of money. There's plenty of resources. There's 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 plenty if we just were collaborative, and compassionate, and loving, and caring, and open, uh, and forgiving, uh, and appreciative that a skin tone. Or, or, or imaginary land border made a difference because it doesn't. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? 
it doesn't uh, those people that are that are uh, trying to get into America from Mexico or trying to get into Europe from Syria they're, the, they're exactly the same as us they deserve the same care and attention and emotional and spiritual well-being as you and I but yet we'd rather spend money on 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 bullshit you know uh, when you think of what what Bezos and and Zuckerberg and 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 et al have made over the last six months in, in finances you know the the, the the top five richest people in the world have have increased their their, their wealth by 250 trillion or something but I can't remember the figure just figures that are absolutely ridiculous that you can't even comprehend them you know but yet we're skint why the bloody hell are we skint if the top five people in the world have increased their wealth by flipping trillions of pounds you know that that imbalance is wrong you know and and, and if we can support and encourage and, and be kind and compassionate and loving there's enough to go around we don't have to live in fear you know, there's there's more than enough for us all to be healthy, wealthy, wise, attuned, fed, watered. Do you know that in America in 2000? I'm on a, I'm on a ramp now, so stop me when you're ready. <laughs> that it's, please do because I just get passionate about this stuff. Talk about fire in the belly. You know, that in America in 2014, Americans spent more on diet products than it would cost to feed every hungry person in the world. The Think about is, that. The irony is crazy, isn't it? What, I mean, what even is that? What, what you know, and we've, you know, what even is that? <laughs> that we as, a, as, a, as a, a race of people have part of us spending so much to get thin that would feed the, 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 the rest that are starving to death. What even is that? I want to say recently it was, uh... I just I did a bit of a presentation and I was preparing for it and I, don't know, I probably had heard it, but the you know the biological fact that you know it's like your daughters are already carrying your grandchildren, mm. you know from the moment of even before their birth when they were in, you know in the womb of your partner. The eggs of your children or the eggs of your grandchildren, are already being made. Mm. You know, and the fact is, you know, it's just when you start looking into that, it's like, you know, they're carrying around, I think it's somewhere between one and two million eggs. And it's sort of, it's a finite supply. That's it. But once it goes there and then it diminishes, diminishes mm -hmm. and all the rest, you know. When you start getting into that, and, and then as you say, you know, we're all kind of drinking dinosaur pee. Well, that's what I heard anyway. You know? Yeah, it's no, like, you're right. You're right. You're right. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like enjoying your heavy on water. It's like, yeah, it's dinosaur pee. But, I think it's it's beautiful and it it just one it's mind blowing but two it also just it just crunches us all down a bit and go you know listen we're you know we're we're oh you're we're, back sorry yeah that you you know we're just we're just we're just a whisper in the wind you know mm. which is, is kind of slightly daunting but also you know I don't know it's so big that you just have to just as you say just sit in all of it you know and you kind of go mm. you know and and i don't know through COVID, for me personally i just go there's there's so much going on and you know we can barely understand ourselves listening to our own voice i mean you know never mind social media if we just listen to ourselves there's a lifetime of work to do, to do there mm -hmm. let alone x number of news channels x number of social media channels x number of politicians x number of God knows what else, influencers, etc. So it's actually sort of we need more, not or less, not more. You know, it's that. You know, it's a crazy time. You know, crazy times. Yeah, I I agree, and 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 I think with that, you know, with, with that thinking, Pete, uh, there's a lovely quote from Thich Nhat Han, uh, the Vietnamese. Um, Buddhist and somebody asked him you know do, do you not worry about the state of the world kind of thing and he takes a breath and he thinks but if I worry about the state of the world then all I'm doing is adding to the worry 
<laughs> you know, so so really what I need to do is mm. be compassionate and kind and loving and caring and forgiving and helpful to myself and to others. And let's see how I get on with that. So it is it is a scary time, but I think what we have to do is think, well, how, how can I be, how can I be and how can I show compassion to myself and to others in, in this scary time? Because adding anxiety, adding anxiety, it, 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 it just simply can't help, can it? I mean, it, it, it can't. Like in, how, in any, well, how, in, do, how do you do that? And what's your passion or what's your purpose? I should say, sorry. I, I would think just for me, Pete, it's just mind your patch, you know, mind your patch, uh, be kind to the people that are, uh, that are engaging with you. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's as much as you can do, you know, mm. or in a forum like this, when, when you have a bigger reach, uh, do that. But if you can, if, if everybody just did that, mm. you know, I mean, if everybody was just kind to the people that they engage with, that takes care of everything, doesn't it? That's, that's, that's the world sorted. If we could get everybody just being kind to the people that are in their, you know, 30 people that they come across in daily life, and, and then that, then that's the world sorted. It's not, it's not that difficult. And, I, and I'm just trying to mind and look after my patch, the mm. patch that I'm on, you know, and, and whoever's on it with me, class, creed, color, shape, size, form, you know, that's all right with me. You know, they'll, mm. they'll, they'll be met with kindness, compassion, love, forgiveness, most of the time, uh, unless I'm being a Muppet. Which happens, which happens, <laughs> of course it does. Uh, but I have to be kind and compassionate to myself even then, you know. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my take on it. That's just just be, mm. just be um, kind. <laughs> Job done. What's your guilty pleasure? Uh, cheese. Mm, what type? All types, all, all all of the cheeses. It has to be a chief cheese. Come on. Uh, there's a wee cheese from Cork called Ardrahan, uh, which is uh, you know. So uh, I love Irish cheese. I love Cashel Blue. I love Irish Brie. Uh, I love cheddar. Uh, I love I mean, French camemberts. I love a really stinky, smelly, rotten, filthy camembert. Uh, my mouth is literally just <laughs> I'm just nearly <laughs> drooling here I'm still thinking of your focaccia from earlier and you know, I put the cheese on it I was like oh my god this is like oh this is sensational yeah uh, so that I, I I promised myself Pete uh, last week I uh, I would be partial to a sneaky cigarette not very often uh, you know, if I was going somewhere, you know, I were going to Stendhal Fest, or something, I'd buy a wee packet of tobacco. You know, I'd be like, oh, I'll get a wee packet of tobacco for Stendhal, you know. Uh, and so that, that would definitely be a guilty pleasure, you know. Uh, but I promised myself last week that I wasn't going to do that anymore. Uh, or certainly really limited to big special occasions, you know. Because I would be partial if, you know, if I was at a friend's house and somebody said, "Yeah, I get out for a cigarette. Do you want one?" I'd be like, "Ah, okay," you know, I go out and have. It. So I'm gonna knock it on the head. So, but that that has been a guilty pleasure. Uh, my caffeine. Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm a sucker for coffee. I love coffee. I love everything about coffee. I love talking about altitude and acidity and uh, you know bean cup tones and cup notes and all that nonsense. I'm a sucker for that. Uh, I would uh, I would never I would never uh, I would never I would never buy a packet of biscuits. 
but I would never walk packet past a packet if they were sitting in the house. <laughs> do you know? Do you know what I mean? Uh, well, what's what's your weakness there now? Uh, well, I, I love uh, for a bar of chocolate. I love a topic. I, I like a topic, and uh, we're, we're, myself and my youngest daughter we would, we would bake a lot, so she makes cookies. Oh man, a class. Uh, so yeah, uh, but again. I don't know that I'd be very fussy, you know, I would, you know, if, if I'm having a cup of tea and I open the cupboard, it doesn't matter whether it's a wagon wheel or a topic or a cookie or a, you know, a Kit it's Kat gone. or a, it's gone, you know, or a hobnob <laughs> or whatever, a ginger nut, a uh, oh, shortbread, sorry, no, I'm a oh, shortbread's king, right. shortbread, I absolutely adore shortbread. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Well, since, since we're on the topic of making each other hungry, what would be your last meal, food and drink? Starters, mains, and desserts. Uh, gee whiz. Two of the things I do to get you off your rant. Mm. <laughs> you've, de you've definitely changed direction there, yeah. You, 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 you've got me. Uh, See, this is a true foodie when they really struggle. They're like, oh, God. Uh, just, just, whenever I answer these questions, it's not what you choose, it's what you don't choose. You know, everything, everything that I don't choose is screaming, pick me, pick me. You know, it's the same as people saying, you know, give us your top 10 albums. I'm like, oh, what do I, oh, what do I leave out then? You know, um, so I was about to say there, I think it would maybe be something Mediterranean, you know, uh, salad and garlic potatoes. If it was my last meal, I would eat some fish. Uh, yeah, a nice piece of sea bass or hake or something. Nice. Uh, garlic, garlic roasted potatoes, and a really nice tomato salad with with lovely olive oil on it. A sprinkle of sea salt, fresh oregano. Uh, that would be my starter. <laughs> 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 so that's the starter, uh, and then. Uh, I like a nice. I I I really like a like a nice stir fry. Yeah, my oh, my wife makes a lovely vegetarian lasagna though as well. And I also love uh, quite often in our house we'll eat uh, you know just like like deli platter kind of stuff. Chop up lots of tomatoes and cheese mm -hmm. and artichokes and olives and gherkins and. Uh, breadsticks and uh, hummus and, and uh, oh, so I, I could probably eat something like that and to drink you know I, I, I haven't I haven't drank anything in a while I haven't drank anything in about five months alcohol wise uh, and I think I'm happy with that so I think if I was going to check out I would just stick with the no alcohol uh, And I think, I think I'd have a really nice alcohol-free beer. So I'd go for a, an Erdinger or something like that, a really nice alcohol-free beer. And then finished off with a uh, really nice coffee, like a really, really, really nice, uh, just a black Americano, with a nice creme on top, and, and the wee plate or tray of petty fours, you know, just nice wee mixed chocolates, wee, wee different ones. Oh, I'm ready to go here. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then would we'll have to would we'll have to do would we'll have to do a cheese board. Would we'll have to do a cheese board at the end. Uh, really nice Irish cheeses and nice wee whole grain crackers and uh, some fruit on there and, and maybe a wee bit of chili jam or something like that. I think I've gone into ketosis here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that would, that would, that would, oh yeah, that would, that would, that would, that would, that would, that would do, that would do, and it would just have to be, I would do that, I would do that somewhere uh, outside, but warm. Uh, so. Well, if you're going to have the Mediterranean salad and you're going to have that, it's got to be yeah. warm on a balcony or warm somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice wooden sort of rustic-y kind of table and stuff. And just a group of friends and my kids, uh, my kids around me. Uh, I'm just laughing and talking shit for three or four hours. Uh, 
Wow. Yeah, and that would be that'd be a good way and then just stand up and check out. I see you guys later. I'm out of here. Awesome. Wow. It's been a journey. Mm. If you were to try and summarize your fire in the belly mm. in one or two words, what would you bring it down to? I just wish Pete my fire in the belly is to help people to chill the feck out just to do that just to help people to chill out if I could do that you know if that was my epitaph I'd be you know help the world to chill out <laughs> I, 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 I'd be a happy man mm. and, and that you know I'm saying that slightly tongue in cheek but really seriously that's, that's a driver for me to help people yeah. you know find some peace find some stillness find some calmness find some fun find some fulfillment find some joy uh, find some space in their lives not be stressed out uh, be open and honest and vulnerable safe chilled out Love it. that would do I now feel chilled out myself but I also feel extremely hungry <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh I love it Kevin it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on so I thank you for that um, just tell us where people remind us Lonely Demons coming out it's available now Lonely Demon is out uh, it's not available now it'll, it'll come out to my, the people that, that uh, help me with my Kickstarter first of all so they'll get it maybe next week something like that and then uh, it'll be it'll be out after that uh, possibly till the end of the summer uh, and then for for work uh, people will find me Facebook LinkedIn Instagram as uh Kevin Young or under my, my business name which is in in mind with a Y I N M Y N D in mind. Uh, yeah and, and it's that thing. People people want to get you. It's, it's not hard it's not hard getting you nowadays, is it? You know? They will just Google yeah. find and find you. So I'm there, I'm out there, I'm available, I'm I'm willing to chat. Uh, you know, if, if anyone feels the need to if anyone feels it would be any value and chat and let's sort that out super Kevin it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for coming on and I look forward to chatting again soon um, uh, it's been it's been amazing I'm, I'm buzzing uh, and, and you've been you've been a cool host I, I felt uh, Pete I felt uh, I felt your space I felt I felt able to to be open and honest and that, that was cool so thank you I appreciate it greatly thank you